My name's Daniel Roy, and today I'm going to explain the most perfect of all the card cheating techniques, stacking the deck. So what does it mean to stack the deck? Well, stacking the deck refers to any situation where you secretly rearrange the cards as you shuffle them. Now, I've just given these cards some shuffles and cuts, and yet I've been able to control all four kings. However, what I just did is not stacking the deck. All I did was to keep the four kings on top. So in other words, the four kings began on top of the deck, and I used some shuffles and cuts that makes it look like I'm shuffling the kings back into the deck, but actually I'm able to bring them all right back to the top. Stacking the deck refers to situations where you actually change the position of the cards in such a way that after the cards are dealt out, you or another player in a game will get the winning hand. So I'll give you an example using the four kings and the same shuffling technique. And there's actually a specific formula for stacking the deck. Now this formula was published in 1902 in a book called The Expert at the Card Table by S.W. Erdnase. Some people speculate that he was a card cheat, others think he might have been a sleight of hand enthusiast posing as a card cheat, it's unclear. What we do know is that his name, S.W. Erdnase, spelled backwards, reads E.S. Andrews. Now to this day, no one actually knows Erdnase's true identity. Which, considering that he was a card cheat revealing the secrets of his trade for money, is probably what he wanted. So here's the formula for stacking the four kings for a five-handed game of cards. I will leave them face up, and I'm going to recite the formula out loud, and I'll do it slowly so that you can follow along. So you start by taking one king, and you put it on the bottom. Then you undercut half the deck, you win jog the top card, you run one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cards, and then you shuffle off, leaving that last king on top. Then you undercut to the out jog, run one, two, three, four cards, throw to the break, run one card, in jog the next card, run one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cards, and then you shuffle off. Then you undercut to the out jog, again drop everything below the break, run one, two, three, four cards, throw, and you're done. So let's see if the stack worked. On the first round, I receive a king. Uh, this hand here is called uh, Pocket Kings. They say that three of a kind is really all you'd ever need to get the money, but just to be sure, I stacked myself all four kings. But you won't really see an overhand shuffle stack these days, because it's a problematic shuffle. First, it's not very thorough. But secondly, you have to pick the cards up off the table, which means other people could catch a glimpse of the bottom card, or they could see a card in the middle as the cards are being shuffled. These days, you're much more likely to see the riffle shuffle, where the cards are split in half on the table and then riffled together. And you can see that the cards are mixed based on the pattern of this interlace. And the riffle shuffle is often combined with cutting sequences like this, and you often riffle shuffle the cards multiple times, yet it's still possible to control cards like, for example, the four kings. So what's going on in this riffle shuffle control? Well, let's take a look with the kings face up on top of the deck. When I riffle shuffle the cards, I'm simply letting the kings fall last. So if I spread them out, you'll see that all the cards are being mixed, I just left all four kings on top. In other words, I just made sure that when I ended the shuffle, the four kings all stayed together on top. Now this is rather transparent if you just keep leaving the top cards on top. So you often combine it with cutting sequences like this that appear to lose the kings in the deck, but actually you're able to hold their position and bring them right back up to the top. But once again, that was not an example of stacking the deck. That was just controlling cards where they start on top and I bring them back to the top. It's also possible to stack the cards with the riffle shuffle. So let's take a look at some riffle stacking. So the four kings once again begin on top of the deck, and I'm going to give these cards a series of shuffles. And during these shuffles, I'm not really concerned with mixing the cards. Rather, I'm much more concerned with repositioning those kings so that when I deal out a five-handed game of poker, the four kings will end up in my hand. So let's see if the stack worked. You can see that on each round, I receive a king. The reason this works is because in those shuffles, I was able to put exactly four cards in between each of the four kings. That's why there are four other players, and all four kings ended up in my hand. So let's take a look at this riffle stacking procedure with the kings face up. So this time, the four kings begin on top of the deck, and I will spread the cards out after each shuffle. So after this first shuffle, you can see that I have added exactly four cards, one, two, three, four cards, in between the king of clubs and the king of hearts. I'll do this again with this next shuffle. On this shuffle, you'll notice that I have added exactly one, two, three, four cards in between the king of spades and the king of hearts. Now the third shuffle is where it gets tricky. 
because I'm going to add four cards in between the next two kings. There's one, two, three, four. But you'll notice that I've had to be careful to not accidentally shuffle cards into this region here, because otherwise I would mess up my stack. And now all that's left is to shuffle four cards on top of the king of diamonds. And if I spread out the deck, you'll see there's now one, two, three, four, king, one, two, three, four, king, one, two, three, four, king, one, two, three, four, king. So when I deal out the cards, of course, the kings will all fall into my hand because there are four other players and I put exactly four cards in between each king and that's why I receive all four kings. So why did I describe riffle stacking as the perfect technique? Well, here's the reason. In most other cheating moves, you can miss and if you miss, you get caught. So for example, with a bottom deal, let's say I had the king of diamonds in the bottom of the deck and I wanted to do a bottom deal, but partway through the bottom deal, I missed the card and it ended up sticking out of the deck. This is not a very flattering picture at the card table and this does not end well. The difference with riffle stacking, unlike a bottom deal, is that if I miss, the worst thing that happens is it's just a normal riffle shuffle. There's nothing to see or catch even if I miss. So I'll give you an example. I'll use the uh, king of spades and the king of diamonds and I'm going to intentionally miss. So let's say I wanted to put four cards in between them, but oh no, instead of four cards, I got three. There's one, two, three cards in between these kings. The thing is, there was nothing suspicious. That was just a riffle shuffle, just like any other riffle shuffle. So this means I won't be able to stack the deck for my own hand this time, but I just wait until the next hand or until the next time that I'm allowed to shuffle the cards. Nothing really bad happens, even though I missed. So this is the beauty of riffle stacking. The best case scenario is you're able to deliver the winning hand or known cards to another player's hand or to your own hand. And the worst case scenario is you just do a riffle shuffle and oh no, you have to move on to the next hand. Now, of course, there's a caveat to this. Let's say I was going to stack the king of diamonds and the king of spades and my riffle stacking was so bad that it looked like this. right? Obviously, I was overdoing the hesitation at the end of the shuffle there, but there's no way that's going to fly. I mean, it's painfully obvious that I was putting cards in between the king of spades and the king of diamonds, and that is, of course, one way that you could get caught riffle stacking. But as long as your riffle stacking doesn't suffer from horrible hesitation like that, and as long as you're able to shuffle the cards with a consistent rhythm, it's very hard to detect. In fact, riffle stacking is one of those techniques where even if you are proficient in it, you can still get fooled by someone else who's really good at riffle stacking. There have been cases where one cheat who's proficient in riffle stacking has been cleaned out by another cheat who was just slightly better at riffle stacking because one cheat couldn't tell that the other cheat was doing anything suspicious and probably couldn't run up the same hands that the other cheat could. So usually they say it takes one to know one, but with riffle stacking, that's not even enough sometimes. Now that riffle stack that I demonstrated with the four kings, that's extremely unrealistic and you'd pretty much never see anyone do that. First, four kings is an overkill poker hand. And secondly, four cards is a lot to stack. Usually it's not even necessary to stack four cards for your own hand. Usually just two cards or maybe a three of a kind is enough. And there are certain scenarios where all you have to do is stack known cards for one player's hand. If you are a very skilled card player, just knowing what cards you're going to receive in advance or knowing the cards that another player will receive is more than enough to win. So this time we won't use a four of a kind. Instead, we'll use just a pair of cards, like for example, the two red aces. This time, I won't stack the deck for a five-handed game. Instead, I'll stack the deck for a six-handed game. So the two red aces go on top of the deck, and I will attempt to stack them for a six-handed game of poker in just two shuffles. So now let's deal. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. So let's take another look at that sequence, but this time in slow motion. Now, as you could see, my two thumbs were doing different things. One thumb 
was manipulating the red aces, and the other thumb was putting cards in between them. This is rather inefficient, and there are some more nuanced stacking techniques that help balance the rolls of the two hands a little bit better, and as a result, you don't have as much hesitation. I'll give you an example. So, I'll start by putting the red aces on top of the deck, and I'll cut them into the middle, and now the shuffle sequence begins. And this time, you'll notice that there's a lot less hesitation, and that's because I'm dividing up the responsibilities differently between my thumbs. Yet when I deal out a five-handed game of poker, you'll notice that I receive the two red aces. So now I'll repeat this demonstration, but this time without looking at the cards. So the two red aces start on top, and I will cut them into the middle, and now I will turn away and close my eyes. So hopefully you should notice the same lack of hesitation, yet this time I should still be able to stack the two red aces for my own hand. So let's see what happens when I deal. On this first round, I receive a red ace, and on this second round, the other red ace. So indeed, it's possible to riffle stack without looking. So why would someone like me learn riffle stacking? I'm not a card cheat, I'm a magician. I like to entertain people, perform magic, make videos about magic and sleight of hand on the internet. Well, it's because it's really fun to practice. Riffle stacking is a bit like hitting a baseball blindfolded. Of course, you can do it with or without looking at the cards, as you just saw, but the reason it's like hitting a baseball blindfolded is that you wouldn't know where the baseball landed until after you took off the blindfold. Similarly, with riffle stacking, you don't know whether it worked or not until you deal out the cards. That's the analogy. Dealing the cards is like taking the blindfold off. So you can do your best to stack the cards correctly, but it's always a mystery as to whether you nailed it until you deal them out. And of course, if you get it right, you try to do it a little bit more quickly or smoothly the next time. And if you get it wrong, you have to figure out what happened and then course correct. So it's just a really fun technique to practice. So I figured that I would conclude with a hilariously unrealistic demonstration of riffle stacking. This time, I will attempt to stack a royal flush in spades, a totally overkill poker hand, for a 10-handed game of Texas Hold'em, and I'll do it in just two shuffles, which is far fewer shuffles than you would ever use in a real game procedure. So, the royal flush in spades begins on top of the deck. Now the sequence begins. Here goes. Here's the first shuffle, and here is the second shuffle. And of course, after you shuffle the cards, you always have to cut. Now, I said it was going to be a 10-handed game of Texas Hold'em, so that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. King of Spades, that's a good sign. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Jack of Spades, another good sign. Burn a card, deal the flop. And on the flop, you'll see we've got a Queen of Spades and an Ace of Spades. Then you deal the turn, and then you deal the river, and that should be a royal flush in spades for a 10-handed game of Texas Hold'em. Now, despite the thousands of hours that I've spent riffle stacking, I am but a magician. Luckily for you, with the permission of my friend who wishes to remain anonymous, you can see what this looks like in the hands of a true expert. So he's going to stack three aces for a six-handed game of poker. So he'll start by placing these three aces on top of the deck. Now notice in these shuffles, there's literally no hesitation. The pacing is even on both sides of the shuffle, it just looks like he's innocently riffling the cards together. Now he'll deal five cards into a pile and then the sixth card to himself each time, and hopefully that should be all three aces. So that's what riffle stacking looks like in the hands of a true expert. In fact, he's got to be one of the top three living practitioners of this technique in the whole world right now. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you like this video, please give it a like. And if you want to see more, consider subscribing to the channel or following me on social media. If you're interested in taking private lessons, I teach magicians of all levels. Or if you want to book a show, you can contact me by email or on my website. Links are in the description. See you next time.